Water. Let's speak to the First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, who joins us from Cardiff. Good morning to you, Mr Drakeford. I just wonder if we can begin with that story that Kate mentioned in the news there. The warnings uh, in the latest minutes to be published by the meeting of SAGE, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, that students should be told to stay on their university campus over the Christmas period because scientists say that they pose risks of larger outbreaks when they return home. Is that something that you would advise? Well, we'll certainly contemplate it because it is true that as people move and travel across the United Kingdom, then that increases the risk of the virus moving with them. We review our regulations every three weeks, so we will have a number of opportunities between now and December to decide whether or not that is necessary advice. The situation changes so rapidly every day that I don't think it's sensible to make a decision today for December, but because we have a three-week cycle, we'll be able to keep on top of that decision very regularly. The Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, uh, has been asked about that this morning, and he said, I don't rule out anything. I wouldn't want to do it. We need to keep people safe. If it was a decision that students would be told to stay in their university accommodation, potentially quite isolated, in a small group, you know, maybe three, four, five, six other people, um, is that a decision that would be made by the UK government or would that be a devolved decision? Because it would be odd, wouldn't it, if, if one nation said one thing that didn't apply to another nation within the UK when the travel affects the yeah. whole country? No, look, I, I completely see that point. Uh, it is a devolved decision. Uh, in the end, higher education is a matter for the Welsh government. But I have been asking right through the coronavirus crisis for a regular rhythm of meetings between the four nations in which we can take decisions that are clearly across border in their implication. We can take it by pooling information, pooling ideas, making these things in a way that everybody can understand and follow. So I agree with you. While the decision would be for us to make, make it alongside ministers for the rest of the UK would make complete sense. Okay, and can I just uh, ask, when you consider these decisions, uh, and we know that the rule of six was uh, extremely distressing for a number of people. For instance, grandparents who could no longer see their grandchildren again if they weren't in the support bubble or within a you know, certain number of households. If you're talking about students away from home, teenagers, where is the balance when it comes to the effect that it might have on them spending Christmas Day on their own away from their families? Well, look, everything we do is a balance. We're forever trying to juggle together the competing uh, demands and competing outcomes that we're trying to bring about. So if students were to be traveling in large numbers across the country, there's no doubt in my mind that that does bring an extra risk for coronavirus with it. Equally, young people having to stay away from their own families brings threats to mental health, well-being, and so on. We have been working very hard with our higher education institutions to make sure that there are services there for young people. The National Union of Students has been fantastically helpful here in Wales in thinking about student well-being, making sure that that is planned into the way in which universities will run over this autumn term. And if we were in that position, which I agree with Matt Hancock, none of us would want to be in, but if we were to have to face it later in this autumn, then, of course, we would work with universities again to make sure that young people were not just abandoned over <clears> Christmas, <throat> but that there would be services there still to support them. Um, one of the issues that will undoubtedly affect students who are returning to university, are the new curfew laws that have been brought in, again, they're slightly different laws depending on which part of the UK you are in. You've amended the initial uh, approach to that uh, and you've sort of slightly uh, softened uh, the curfew laws in Wales. Here in, in England, uh, at 10 o'clock, uh, the service has to stop. Uh, restaurants and pubs will close. You've changed it slightly. You've, you've allowed the opportunity for restaurateurs, for pubs and bar owners to have a softer sort of clearing out time, as it were. What was it that made you change your mind over that, Mark Drakeford? Why did you not stick with the, the more strict um, 10 o'clock closing time, everyone's got to be gone? Well, so many businesses in Wales, Ben, so many restaurants have developed a model in which they 
have a first sitting of people at seven o'clock in the evening. Uh, then there's a break while the restaurant is cleaned and made COVID secure. And then a second sitting of people arrive between 8.30 and nine o'clock. Now, if you were to say to those people that they've got to be out on the pavement at 10 p.m., then I think that business model is very, very difficult uh, to run. Whereas if you have something which uh, many of people listening and watching this morning, I'm sure will remember the old drinking up time yeah. that I remember from uh, my uh, youth, then what we will have in Wales is that you can't buy alcohol after 10 o'clock, but there'll be 20 minutes or so after that for people to finish their meal, finish their drink, and to leave in an orderly way. And I think it just makes the business of running a restaurant or a pub easier. It preserves jobs, and it does it without any adverse impact. So what's, what's to stop somebody at one minute to 10 ordering another bottle of wine, two bottles of wine? Well, well it's the good management of the pub or the restaurant. Uh, and I've been very heartened in Wales by the evidence we have of the very serious way in which people who are responsible for those settings are discharging their responsibilities in the COVID emergency. So what would stop it would be the good sense of the person behind them bar saying, we're not doing that. You've only got 20 minutes to drink up and leave and you're not going to be able to do that. Uh, we were just talking about the mental health of students. In just a moment, we're going to be debating whether school exams for this school year, next year, should be scrapped mm. or certainly delayed. Uh, I wonder what your take on this is. We saw what happened in the summer with the absolute debacle over the algorithm was set about. Susanna experienced it firsthand with both uh, two of her sons who went through GCSEs and A-levels. I've got a son who's doing GCSEs the next year, and I know that he's already talking about this with his friends at school. What would be the process, do you think, and what point would you be pushing the government to say, do you know what, the students have missed out on too much work already? Uh, we've had a, a survey that's been done for Good Morning Britain that suggests that 93% that of teachers are scared about the amount of work that their students mm. have missed out on because of the six months that they weren't able to be in school. I know lots of teachers were teaching online and the schools will still, were still open. But would, could you foresee a, a moment where actually exams next year could be suspended? Well, we've set up uh, an expert group led by somebody from one of the Welsh universities to give us advice on exactly that. Uh, I definitely don't want to see a repeat of what we went through uh, this year. We're looking to see whether it would be better to rely on coursework teacher assessment and to make that decision early, mm -hmm. or whether it is possible, given everything we've learnt, to run exams in a way that doesn't put staff and students at risk. We'll get the report to that group in October. The decisions for Wales will be made in Wales and we'll use the views of students, of families, of the people who run exams here in Wales and try and make an early decision yes. so that parents and students know what they will be facing this year and into the exam season next year. Because, of too. course, it's the teachers, isn't it? The teachers need to know for their curriculum. The sooner you make this decision, the sooner that dictates how much of the syllabus they teach the children or how they go about teaching those students as well. So the sooner this decision is made, the clearer the rest of the academic year will be for everybody. Well, completely uh, agree with that. It's why we set up the group. It's why it'll report as early as October. But we want that decision to be made with teachers, not for teachers. It's really important in Wales we have a social partnership approach here in which we try and get all the people who are have a voice in a decision around the table together, thrash out some difficult issues and come to an agreed position that everybody is willing to support. Mark and the Dray voice of yeah. teacher unions is really important to Mark us. Mark the, the difference between the nations is very stark, isn't it? I mean, for instance, if we just take household mixing, in Scotland and Northern Ireland, uh, you can't mix households. In Wales, as I understand it, four households can mix and children are exempt. Uh, in uh, England, it's the rule of six, and that can be six different households, one from each, and uh, children are included. And we've already talked about uh, other devolved decisions. Is it sensible to have so many different rules in local areas or... Would it be better if there were uh, coordinated rules? Because, for instance, when we listen to you talking about the 10pm curfew, it sounds like you think Boris Johnson has got it wrong. Yesterday, Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland told us that there wasn't enough communication uh, between all of you. What's your view? Is this coordinated enough or is it confusing? Well, 
I've argued for a long time for a pattern of reliable engagement between the four devolved administrations. Uh, the Prime Minister representing England for the decisions that are made for England, and then the rest of us around the same table. It's not happened. It's been sporadic. It's been ad hoc. It's been at short notice. What we need is a pattern that we can all rely on, because the more we talk together, even though we have to make decisions that are right for our own nations, the more we share that information, understand each other's point of view, the more we are able to coordinate. Now, we've been heading in the same direction, I think, all the way through the of the coronavirus. But if we were talking more, we would be in a better position to explain why we need to do things differently, sometimes in different places, and to get that message across to people in a way that minimizes confusion. Yeah. Okay, well, we well, share One your last thing, sorry, Mark, before we go, something a little bit more interesting, or a little bit more uh, optimistic. Uh, there's rumours that Ryan Reynolds, the movie star, <laughs> uh, could be about to launch uh, a takeover at Wrexham Football Club, of course, Ooh. the fifth tier. Uh, strong Welsh history in the world of football, uh, him and, and one of his friends. Uh, would you welcome Ryan's uh, involvement in Wrexham? And, and what would you say to him about uh, the, the, the sort of benefits of being a part of uh, Wrexham Football Club? Well, there's huge benefits of being part of Wrexham Football Club, the oldest football club in Wales with a fantastic fan uh, base, utterly loyal, owning the club itself. Uh, this is a Hollywood actor. If he can play centre forward, I'm sure he'd be welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's buying himself a position. We didn't oh, think I'm not about sure that's what he's offering. We didn't think he just wants to play. <laughs> uh, two million quid would be enough to play up front. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this morning.